Sasakwala and Ellie Wiesel founded Forum 2000 for a purpose. for convening another extraordinary gathering of Forum 2000. So those people, they are peace, or think more seriously, and we should develop new ideas, and then important is implementation. Pánové, vážení přítomní, já vás co nejsrdečněji vítám na konferenci Forum 2000. The world is upside down. How should we put it back together? Are we able to act responsibly? Can we work together? play by the rules, and restore solidarity? Let's use this crisis as an opportunity. A new world emerging? Watch the online Forum 2000 conference, October 12th to 14th. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, uh, let me welcome you to this afternoon's panel of the Forum 2000 devoted to Europe's role in an unstable world. Uh, uh, I, I take this title to mean a question about Europe's role as an international actor, its capacity to respond to the challenges. And this, of course, has been a very old question um, uh, about the capacity of the largest trading bloc to be more than a dwarf uh, on the international political scene. So this is a very old question, but the setting is new. And uh, this is what we're going to be discussing with uh, our uh, two uh, panelists, uh, uh, Alina Polyakova, who is the president and CEO of the Center for European Policy uh, Analysis in uh, Washington, I do not give a full biography because we have very little time and the biographies are available on the web. Uh, and second speaker is Jerzy Pomianowski, who is the executive director of the European Endowment for Democracy. For our American uh, colleagues, they know about the uh, uh, National Endowment for Democracy. Well, in Europe, we have uh, something that would like to emulate that, perhaps, and that's called the European Endowment for Democracy. And uh, indeed, democracy is uh, uh, part of our subject, uh, though uh, the focus uh, is perhaps uh, uh, first on the international role of the EU. I, I said this is an old question. It has been debated endlessly about uh, what would it take for the EU to be an international actor? But I said the setting is new. The world has changed. Our neighborhood, the EU neighborhood has changed. And the EU itself has changed. And therefore, I, my, my first question to, to our panelists is precisely that, is uh, in what way the changes that are occurring in the international system move to bipolarity, between US and China, for instance, in our neighborhoods, increasingly destabilized, and in the EU itself, what, uh, uh, in what way these changes put in a new context this very old question about the EU as an international actor? Maybe Alina first. Sure, well, thank you so much, Jacques. It's uh, really a pleasure to at least see you virtually. I certainly wish we could all be in Prague together today as well. Uh, one day soon, I very much hope. Uh, we have a short panel, so I'll keep my uh, remarks very brief to start, but I want to speak to your geopolitical question. Uh, what is the role of the EU in a changing and uncertain geopolitical environment that is increasingly defined by competition between so-called great powers? Um, I think Europe has a choice, and the EU specifically, 
whether the continent can act as a coherent whole when it comes to a united and comprehensive foreign policy, a foreign policy that is in the EU's national interest, not in the national interest of Germany, France, or, or Poland, or other member states, and to the extent to which the EU as a bloc can act in a coherent way to first and foremost uh, manage and compete with China, because we are an increasingly competitive rather than cooperative environment with China, and work closely with the United States, because at the end of the day, the transatlantic alliance is key here. There's a few areas where the EU has decided to stake out a place to lead, but to my mind, it remains uh, quite uncertain to what extent the European Union will be able to, for one, shape the nature of digital policy, which of course the commission has made a primary uh, role, a primary agenda setting item. But I think the irony in Europe today is that the commission and the EU want to regulate tech and want to lead on the regulatory agenda, but without being the innovator on technology and digital issues. And I think that sets up a real tension uh, between where Europe will find itself in a world that is increasingly defined by the competition over digital technologies and whether it will be able to lead and, and innovate in this space. So I think going forward, Europe has, uh, in the next few years, I think quite significant choices that will determine the next decade and the next 20 or even 30 years, uh, whether Europe will be a playing field for so-called great powers like the United States, China, and to a lesser extent Russia, or whether it will be an actor in shaping its own fate um, and its own uh, agenda when it comes to foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I will refrain from any comments at this stage, but you mentioned the transatlantic relationship, and clearly that is uh, a new dimension. It used to be taken for granted uh, until, well, I was going to say until the, uh, uh, the last election in the United States, but I think the problems uh, uh, go further back. But it certainly shouldn't be taken or cannot be taken for granted any longer the way it used to be. And there is, that is clearly a factor that we may return to in the discussion. But uh, first, uh, about the challenges we are facing, uh, Jerzy Pomianowski. Thank you, Jacques. Thank you, Alina. <clears throat> it is a pleasure to be with you on the same uh, panel. And to address this uh, quite uh, complex uh, question, first, um, uh, let us say openly, uh, uh, Europe uh, represents many national interests. And those interests are not necessarily aligned and not necessarily uh, fully uh, coherent. So uh, it is, if we look from the pure point of view of national interest, both uh, security interest, uh, both uh, economic interest as well as other type of uh, interests. Uh, yet, there is something uh, specific that uh, makes Europe as a concept, uh, as a space for living, uh, attractive. It's not just uh, economic wealth, which is important, but it is also uh, a system in which we are uh, living, which is not just a democracy, but also a way how democracy is defined, developing, and how democracy is actually implemented. And here we have a main answer uh, to, the, to the question uh, how the future may look like. And I would say in a very brief way and in simplifying the message of uh, this uh, discussion, saying that all aspects are important, the security strength, uh, the, the military strength of Europe, the economic strength, the innovative, innovative uh, or innovation uh, aspect, uh, research, all this is important and will decide about the role of uh, Europe in the future world. But the one thing definitely will decide and determine it. It is whether we are able to stick to the values that are founding values of, uh, of European Union and founding values of this space in which we are living. This is a result of reflection after the Second World War. When we have conflicting interests, sooner or later, they may lead to conflict. First, to the conflict of interest, and then eventually to the war. 
And that is what we learn from the history. And only way to prevent this kind of scenario is to stick to the values that says we manage conflicts differently and we organize our society around different set of values. Here is the answer. As long as in Europe we are able to stick to those values and be very, very persistent on it and we be in a solidarity and at the same time in a understanding that we have to give up something to protect those values from our egoistic interests. Uh, if, if we are not able, then the concept of Europe will fall apart and the Europe itself will not be able to stand up uh, the global uh, competition in every sense, politically, militarily, economically. Mm -hmm. Well, so we have at least two important dimensions uh, of our uh, question about Europe as an international actor. One is the global competition, the digital competition that Alina referred to. And then we have, and that very much refers to economic uh, capacity, economic competition, regulation. But the uh, dimension that uh, Jerzy Pomianowski has just mentioned, values, and that uh, entails, of course, commitment to uh, democracy, rule of law, and such things. And many people, uh, uh, especially in the foreign policy uh, uh, analyst community, uh, like to oppose the two. You know, you, you, you either promote your your interests, your realist, this is a realist school, uh, you have to... Uh, you have you build up a capacity, you promote your interest, and uh, uh, those who think that you cannot, in the long run, promote your interest unless you promote your value. How do we keep the balance between the two? Uh, uh, Europe is the largest trading bloc, so it has a certain capacity to have its interest heard on the international scene uh, uh, in that realm. Uh, but when we talk about uh, values, and we by that we suppose refer to as well to democracy and uh, um, rule of law, human rights, such things. We discover that uh, the capacity to act is very limited. And my question to uh, Jerzy first would be: uh, uh, How can Europe promote uh, such values in a world? where we see the emergence of authoritarian powers. Uh, the, the, the international system has changed. Look at China, Russia, Turkey. In the EU neighborhood, the two main challengers, Turkey and Russia, are both authoritarian. So not easy to promote democracy in our neighborhood with such powerful and authoritarian neighbors. And related to that, well, how do we promote democratic values if we sometimes uh, are not observing them within the EU <laughs> itself. So that may be a subsidiary question. Uh, Jerzy, wh wh what's your take on this? No, Jacques, you are perfectly right. This is not a subsidiary question, it's a main question, because this is exactly uh, where the weakness of the construct is uh, uh, coming to picture. If we are not credible enough to ourselves to protect our values within the territory of European Union, uh, and as I said, this is a founding values of the European Union, then of course our credibility to act and our efficiency to act is automatically diminished. So here we have uh, 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 an important dimension of, um, of Europe. And, and here we would be mistaken just looking into, let's say, Poland, rule of law issues or Hungary uh, situation. No, if we are talking about values, we have to look into uh, Cyprus, we have to look into uh, uh, real estate uh, uh, businesses and the dark uh, uh, banking uh, um, systems that are protecting oligarchs' money from Russia and from uh, uh, Ukraine, and many other aspects of our own system that looks into values as it is comfortable to, um, uh, to the different players in Europe. So we are not consistent, we are not coherent, uh, in protecting and implementing those values um, within our own system. That's why our credibility is not that uh, um, big, not that strong. Uh, 
Nevertheless, still, if we try to balance, if we try to say where is more human rights protection or less, where is a little bit uh, uh, more of rule of law and less, then we can definitely say still Europe represents the space where human rights, civil rights uh, are protected most in the world. the world. Whether it's enough, Whether it's enough to be credible, credible, it is difficult to difficult say today. To today. Um, my own inclination would be to follow along uh, this uh, path and, and, and take the case of Belarus, for instance. We are confronted uh, on our doorstep with the question of uh, uh, basically a regime that, is, uh, that has blatantly uh, trampled upon elementary democratic practice. The EU would like to act, but has very limited means to do so. And as we have discovered when measures were to be taken, it can be divided on this. And you have countries, you mentioned Cyprus a minute ago. Well, uh, Cyprus was among those who said uh, we should not uh, take any sanctions vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Belarus unless we do something about the role of Turkey <laughs> in the Mediterranean. And uh, this is basically the one of the problems of the EU. It has East and South, and, it has, and it's not a choice between East or, or South. It has to do both. And how does it combine? How does it combine the two? Uh, I don't know what is your uh, view. How you build a political consensus where the hierarchy of priorities can be different? If you look at the situation from, let's say, southern Europe, or if you are looking at it from uh, the Baltic countries or Poland, um, Jerzy, what 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 would be your well, uh, uh, well just a just, just a, a quick reaction. Just uh, a quick reaction. Uh, my my grandmother, my, who my survived grandmother war in who survived Warsaw, war in Warsaw, used to say, "When you don't know what to do, when you are losing your own compass, then simply stick to the values, because this you will never regret. So here is the answer: they are always competing priorities. But do what you have to do according to the core values. React to Belarus is equally important as giving signals to Turkey to reduce aggressive behavior. And of course, there are conflicting interests or different priorities within EU member states. But that's exactly what I'm complaining about. They, they, should, they should understand without building Solidarity, there is no efficient EU. Yeah. Well, this, this has been always a difficulty uh, when you have conflicting priorities or let's say different hierarchy of priorities in the EU. There are those who think, oh, uh, we should build political dialogue and we will come to a compromise. And the danger there is you look for lowest common denominator. Or uh, there are those who believe in institutional uh, uh, recipes. Uh, you introduce uh, qualified majority voting for foreign policy issues, and that way you make it easier, so to speak, to, to, to create uh, at least uh, some degree of consensus. Uh, uh, I don't know whether uh, uh, Alina wants to say something about that. What would it take for the EU <laughs> to, uh, to get its act together in, in matters of foreign and security policy? Well, that, that is the, the crux of the question I was alluding to um, in my opening comments, that we not only see a east-west divide in Europe for quite a long time, we see divisions across issues emerging between north and south, and what you could call sort of the core Europe bloc, uh, France and Germany, and at one point the UK. We haven't talked about Brexit yet. Uh, but of course, that's a key issue that is undermining the, the EU's ability to be a cohesive bloc. And I think going forward, I th the, what has to happen is that there needs to be a re- energizing of 
the notion that what holds us together in terms of values to go back to what we're talking about earlier is much greater than what's been driving us apart. And Belarus is a fantastic example of this. Democratic, liberal democratic values are not just appealing to those living in Europe. And Belarus has been the of 1989. Now we see that the unfinished business wants to get finished. Because why? Because the people living in a digital society want to live in an open and free society. And we have been too mired in the future. We know what's going to happen in the future. That we know that authoritarianism is going to win. You know, if you read so many interesting local articles about the future of they are opining on the death of democracy. This is a mea culpa. But of course it's not. And of course the notion that authoritarianism will inevitably win is a false one. Yes, that's, uh, Yerji, I suppose, wants to address that. Or you agree with that? I think I've lost. I'd be happy to say a few more words. I'd be happy if to say a few more. Uh, I'm Is getting it? a bit of a sound echo as well. Uh, but I'm hoping that that's not coming through. So I, my point about Belarus was to say that the only way that we can act as a common bloc is to understand that what binds us is our common commitment to democracy. And Ukraine and what happened in Ukraine around the Euromaidan movement and the revolution of dignity was a lost opportunity for Europe. It was an opportunity for the EU to rally around the people who were dying on the streets for European values, for democracy, for liberal values. And now we're seeing that happen again in Belarus. So this is another opportunity to support and understand that de open societies, democratic societies are not vulnerabilities. Uh, we have assets and we have to start acting in a way that clearly shows our economic soft power, our political soft power, and most of all, our values-based soft power across the world, because these are not European ideals, they're not American ideals, they're universal ideals. And I would really encourage everyone um, living in Europe to look at Belarus and be inspired about what's happening and to not lose that opportunity again um, to really raise the flag of democracy and freedom uh, that the EU flag now represents to so many people across the world. Well, that certainly is a major issue. You just said, you know, opportunity. Uh, the Belarus uh, uh, crisis is an opportunity for the EU to speak out for those values, and it can do so. It can offer support uh, to uh, the opposition in Belarus uh, in some ways. Uh, when the French president meets in Vilnius with the, uh, uh, with the leader of the Belarus opposition, clearly this is mark of political support. But that is also more or less the limit of what can be done, because you can have economic sanctions, you can speak out, but you soon discover that the neighborhood of the EU, the Eastern neighborhood, is a shared neighborhood. There is, it, it's, it happens to be also Russia's neighborhood. And therefore, given what happened in the Ukraine, you will have Europeans in two minds about uh, how to proceed, how far should they be engaged and in what, with what means. And uh, uh, that raises more or less the, yeah, the Russian question <laughs> in the equation uh, or, uh, in the European role in, the, in its neighborhoods. Um, absolutely. I don't know if we have Yershi back, uh, but on the Russia question specifically, I think the notion that these countries are a legit, legitimately should be called a part of Russia's neighborhood is actually a false one. What we've seen over and over again is that countries that Russia sees 
as belonging to its neighborhood. Those countries don't want to be in Russia's neighborhood. Uh, Ukraine doesn't want to be in Russia's neighborhood. Georgia doesn't want to be in Russia's neighborhood. And increasingly, the people of Belarus don't want to be in Russia's neighborhood either. And so I think it, it, is our, it should be our agenda to encourage the notion that it's not that a country or people belong in one neighborhood and the other. Those people have the right to choose their own fate and their own destiny. And over and over, what we've seen is that when the people speak, they don't want to go east, they want to go west. And I think with all of the issues we're having in our societies, the kind of polarization and divisions that we're experiencing in every Western democratic country, including obviously the United States, um, around so many potentially divisive issues around religion, around ethnicity, around race, around refugees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, we have to take this opportunity to see that still, despite all that, uh, Europe and the EU remain a beacon of hope for so many across the world. And the Russian desire to keep these countries under its heel is not legitimate, nor should it be given the kind of credibility to just assume that this is the way things are. We cannot accept the status quo. Uh, you were asking... I was not suggesting... Yeah, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I am back. <laughs> you were asking about Belarus. I think Belarus for me is an excellent example how the certain degree of persistence and also sticking to the values actually paid off. Because for many years, if we look into different conferences and discussions, we were starting them with the general description well, uh, there is an apathy. The society of Belarus uh, has uh, no vision. Uh, the leaders, uh, I mean, opposition leaders, has no visions. Nothing happens. So we better maybe go to real politic, uh, deal with regime and Lukashenko, make a kind of transborder cooperation, anti-money laundry, all that is necessary for the security of Europe, ecology, because this is the reality and we have to deal with it. Instead of it, we were very persistent in continuing support to civil society, to independent media in Belarus. Uh, uh, besides those kind of negative pictures, they were given by many experts. And suddenly, all those many experts were surprised with the freshness and the strength and the vibrancy of the civil society uh, of the Belarus that stood up and says, no, we are young, we are female, and we want our country back to us, we want dignity and we will live in the, in the normal society, not run by the director of the cohos. So uh, the, and the, this is a kind of surprise to many that would argue for so-called real politics. And we should apply a similar logic in many other directions. Yes, it may take time. Yes, it may take many years. But if we are persistent and coherent in our approaches to those agendas, we may wait for the moment when societies are ready to take their future in their hands. And we have to help them. Yeah, well, uh, uh, we are uh, short, uh, running out of time a bit. So let me bring back uh, so this crucial question of uh, uh, democracy in EU's foreign policy. Uh, and sometimes the discovery that it has uh, limits in the in the means to promote it. Uh, it used to believe the EU used to believe that opening its markets, uh, opening its borders, it's, it used to be called mobility, and uh, uh, providing some loans for reforms. That these were the tools that were helping to bring democratic governments uh, uh, on its periphery. So this would be gradual change in the, on its periphery. What happened in Ukraine, I think, made many people think about the limits of that approach. And, and this, is, uh, this is not a reason to give it up. It's simply uh, an occasion to, uh, to think through uh, the, uh, the, the difficulty and the, and the challenges uh, uh, at stake. And uh, if I could bring back to, to, the, um, to the point where uh, I started about the world that has changed. Uh, uh, Alina referred to the fact that we didn't mention Brexit. We didn't mention uh, enough the transatlantic relationship. That used to be a self-evident proposition in the old days, and especially on the question of 
supporting democratic values. We had many differences over other issues, could be trade issues, could be some foreign policy questions, but on basic democratic values, there was always coherence, convergence and support. Now we see for the first time we have an American president that says that EU is an enemy. This is a quote. And we have a lot of question marks about the relationship. So my question to Alina, we have little time, but she will tell us very straight, uh, are we back on track if there is a different president in the White House? My short answer to that is no, unfortunately. Um, I agree with what you alluded to in your opening comment, Jacques, which is that there have been underlying trends that have led to divisions between Europe and the United States. But certainly this White House and this administration have no doubt amplified. And I think the biggest problem with this White House is that they have been refusing to see multilateralism, which of course is the basis of the European Union's decision-making model and the entire bloc's existence. And they, this White House refuses to participate with multilateral institution, and in fact, often disdains them. So that I do anticipate would change if the election goes um, against the, pre the president. But in terms of US priorities in the world, there is a consensus in Washington that the problem is China. Whether we go at solving, quote unquote, solving that problem alone, or together with Europe, that will be determined by the election. But I think we're going to have to work very, very hard, and it's going to take more than four years of a different administration, I mean, even more than eight years, to figure out what transatlantic alliance is today, not what it looked like in the 20th century. What is the 21st century version? of a transatlantic alliance that can stand up to authoritarianism. We don't have the answer to that yet. We have the answer. We may have some elements of the answer after the American election. I would agree with you that this is not a magic uh, solution to all the underlying problems that you just referred to. Unfortunately, I'm just being told that our time has run out. We are in the red and uh, the clock is, we are going over the clock and I'm supposed to conclude, and uh, uh, I don't, I will not attempt a summary, I will simply say that Europe is facing new challenges in its neighborhood. It has, uh, uh, it is now at least united by core values of democracy, uh, but it discovers the difficulty of trying to uh, have them uh, 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 promote them in its neighborhoods, and that crucially, much will depend on uh, the capacity to rebuild a transatlantic relationship and therefore the West to speak uh, more coherently uh, on the international scene on those questions of democracy, defending liberal values uh, in the international system. I want to thank our two speakers, Alina Polyakova, Jerzy Pomianowski, uh, for their contribution to the uh, uh, Forum 2000 debate this year. Thank you to both. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank, thank you very much. much.